This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. I'm Giovanni Singleton, and I'm Lunch Poems Coordinator. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, so today, um, it is my great pleasure also to introduce um, this afternoon's reader, uh, Trung Tran. Uh, Tran is a poet and a visual artist. His publications include the Book of Perceptions, Placing the Accents, Dust and Conscious, which was awarded the San Francisco Poetry Center uh, Book Prize in 2002. Um, in addition to Within the Margin and Four Letter Words. He is also a recipient of the San Francisco Arts Commission Individual Artist Grant in Poetry and Visual Arts, um, the California Arts Council Grant, the Creative Work Fund Grant, and the Fund for Poetry Grant. So he's well granted. <laughs> His artwork has been shown at Intersection for the Arts, Soma Arts, and the Kearney Street Workshop. In February of last year, he had his first solo exhibition at the Mina Dresden Gallery. Uh, he lives in San Francisco and is a visiting professor of poetry at Mills College. And Juliana Spar has said of Trung's work, since his first book in 1999, Trung has been skillfully walking a delicate tightrope between the lyrical and the innovative. His work is distinctive for its attention to the politics of language and the skill with which he wields richness and beauty. Four Letter Words continues this investigation as it delves into the many ways that one is shaped as a writer, as a human being. And in summary, I will just say, um, Chong is absolutely fierce. So please welcome him. Thank you, Giovanni, for uh, having me here. And um, to Professor Haas, who's not actually here, but I did want to say thank you as well. I'm going to take you guys through a, uh, a journey of sorts. And, and the reason why I'm doing that is because I, I, want, it, I want the arrival to make sense, um, what I'm doing currently, um, which is um, a series of erasures. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little bit from each of the books, and then hopefully it will bring us it's a kind of a circular journey, and it'll bring us back to the beginning um, in some way. So this is um, these couple of poems that I'm going to read um, right off are from a collection called Placing the Accents. And it's a collection that I, um, I wrote between 1992 and 95 um, as a grad student in a MFA program. This poem's called 43075. Bury the camouflage by the dwarf banana tree. Tear down curtains, cut into squares. Three feet by three feet. Sew into shoulder packs. For travel, need rice into portable loaves. We're going on a trip. Two shirts, a pair of pants. No marble, she insisted. We're going on a giant boat. She sold the rooster, my prized pet rooster. Would buy me a new one, she promised she would. Keep the gun, a souvenir. Don't ask why, we're going on a trip. And this is a poem called What Remains. One, for the altar she insisted on the kind that bruised a persimmon, his heart. Fluorescent fire thorn crown at one end, an arrow's tip, lips collapsing at the other. Two, it has long been forgotten this practice of the mother weaning a child. She crushes the seeds of a green chili, rubs it to her nipple. What the child feels, she too will share in this act of love. My own mother says it was not meant to be cruel when cruelty, she tells me, is a child's lips torn from breasts. As proof, back home, 
the women wear teeth marks. Four, early summer when corn is sweetest, when the 10 cent fruit sale offers oranges, apples, blood red plums, when she prepares herself for the wandering dead, soul searching homeless for a meal when placed at the porch with incense burning, an invitation, when, when beyond the door lives a Catholic family, take all that is needed, but please do not enter. Five, the persimmon she kept in a rice bin, a remedy passed down by her mother's mother, guaranteed to remove the aftertaste. I took for the sake of taking, against her wishes, the persimmon, this fruit as if knowing, would break at the touch, my fingertips, nectar bleeding. So I'm going to move on to a collection entitled Dust and Conscience. It's actually a, a two-part book, in a, in a sense, because Dust and Conscience is, is perhaps a book about innocence, and then I follow it up with four-letter words, which is a book about the loss of in innocence. If only I were a dissident poet, I could claim my poems were once written in a cell, scraps of paper brought to me by a rat on a string. If I wrote about the blue skies, would you look up, point to God in a pillow of clouds? If I wrote about the blinding sun, would you stare with faith, see for the first time? I mean, truly see. If only I were a dissident poet, my, my name, its meaning, would I then care to know? In the Book of Beginnings. To preserve the bitterness, he scattered his children in four directions, sat back in his chair and proceeded to grow old. He waited until the time was right. He paid them a visit. When they went to kiss their father, he licked their skin. He found the bitterness still clinging to his tongue. He tells his children, I want to go home. Approach it as you will, but do so knowing that the line which connects the perceptions to the perceived is crossed with the line of the needs and necessities. And there at the crossing are the casualties, fragments to stories, some still struggling to find the beginnings. I've located you to a letter in the alphabet. Do not think it wrong of me. It is by no means a reduction of your being this is done only so that I may address you, free of the inhibitions found in the name. They are temporarily submerged, if not discarded. Let's say that you are K and I am T, removed from our context. T met K in country V. T fell in love with K and V, the sum of which is a language unrequited. This is from the Book of Perception. Perhaps in another time, our story would be different. There would be no leaving and thus no returning. You would be the teacher in a northern village, and I the fisherman. We would live quietly to the background singing of cicadas, the whispering of the ocean's breath, and poems like weeds would grow from the cracks of our lives. Perhaps in that life, the frog and the scorpion are better off as lovers. This is from the Book of Ruptures. Enter the scorpion in a different time, a different place. Why then is the story still the same? He blames it on the writer. This incessant need to be tragic. It could have been. It should have been. A cliche of an ending. Happily ever after. Now is that so hard to write? The other night, I sat in a bar with three other people. I'll call them Carlito, Anna, Bartholomew. For no other reason than that of music, the way these names fall from my tongue, 
We were playing this game nonsensical in the moment, profound in life. We each asked a question. We each gave an answer. If you could be a character in a sitcom, who would it be? Note for this question. You must choose a character of the opposite gender. If you could relive a single moment, when would it be? Note for this question, you can relive it only. Altering the past is not an option. If you could live in any period, what period, what time? For this question and this question only, you must change your race. Your gender is optional. If the world would end this time tomorrow, what would you do today, now? Note, the answer to the last nonsensical question we'll use as a starting point to begin the next round of nonsensical questions. Enter the frog speaking in his own defense. For the record, I did not write these poems. What do I know of love and of tragedy? What do I know of poetry? What I do know, I have always known. I am a toad. This is my nature. From the Book of Endings. Every word of every image is a step towards the end. This urgency dictates that the sentence as we know it no longer an option. Grammar is obsolete. Stories once told in detailed chapters have been reduced to a noun, a verb. The father dies. The lover leaves. In search of his own ending, perhaps now the writing can finally begin. I am reverting to that voice, not capable of telling stories. In place of the narrative, that voice takes on a child's declarative, I am the father, I am the son, I am the lover, I am, I am. The voice that existed before there were stories, stories for the telling, the voice that speaks in cryptic tongues, the voice that insists on saying, I love you, and hearing it as, I, you love. I'm going to move to four-letter words at this point. Uh, and again, I, I started by saying that this this book feels like it's a, it's a book about the um, loss of innocence. I'd like to read the dedication first. This book is for my cousin Nort, who works at a triangle sandwich factory, making the kind of sandwiches one buys from vending machines. This book is for his commitment to making delicious, nutritious sandwiches. But even more importantly, this book is for the people who eat the sandwiches, because they deserve delicious, nutritious sandwiches free of preservatives from the book of that. This is an overt omission of the interior. It is written from the outside for public consumption, full of gumption. It is written in the hopes of finding an end, committing sins along the way. The stranger is careful in rolling my cigarette. He hands it to me. He waits. He raises the lighter towards my waiting lips. He smiles. He looks. He looks intently. He conveys in that moment, lingering before. You know you're doing it again. Doing what? You know that thing you do. What thing? That thing that drives me crazy. I'm just saying. Can't we talk about something else? Like porn? You're always looking at porn. That's not true. I'm looking for porn. There's a big difference. This is a brick of a story whose life is just too real for the simile who grew up with a gun loaded in his back pocket, wanting just to be. So throw it through a pane glass window at the outsider looking in and the insider wanting out of this poem at the edge of a man-made forest, a manifesto of sorts. For a society of trained assassins existing just beyond the constructed horizon, for the gambler who bets his way towards the next nonsensical line. And let's not forget the straight jacketed Jack who dreams of one day delivering this poem like a cactus for that child in the corner who knew the answer. The answer was to stay quiet in the corner. 
and beware of those who meet on the outskirts armed with a deck of playing cards, conceit as currency. Let's just call it what it is, an extended metaphor, a score, a humongous heap of hideous hope. This is a poem for the shoplifters, train hoppers, shit talkers writing their way towards the margins of the page. The poem simply reads, meet me with a 40 at the gate at a quarter past eight. We'll storm the castle. We'll smoke a joint. We'll juke the guards. We'll jive with Jesus. We'll take back our prayers, our pornographic prayers. We'll kick it in the parking lot of the stop and go. Part of the agenda of this book was to, to unlearn. So I did things that I, I would normally um, not do, which one of them is to rhyme incessantly. So this is one of those poems. I see nothing wrong in seeing. I see light in that of being. I see glare, and it is blinding. I see a diversion from the finding. I see wrong. I see right. I see you, and I want to fight. I see your hand holding a red brick. I see it hidden in a limerick. I see defiance in wanting to rhyme. I see you committing a crime. I see a metaphor. I see a chore. I see language treated as a whore. I see the dust swept under your rug. I see you tug. I see this act as an act of war. I see you and you and you. I see what's false. I see what's true. I see you and only you. I see a poem, too simple a poem. I see this as looking for a home. I see a brick. I see a stick. I see no need to end this conflict. This is from the Book of Lies. This is a chronicle written where English is broken, sorted, salvaged, and saved for consumption. In time, it will be adopted as a delicacy. Please understand that the metaphor when used here is used out of necessity. A grain of rice before all else is really just that, a grain of rice. That striving for clarity, looking for an audience, wanting to be heard, this goes against the nature of things. This poem, the line, every single word, the slanted rhyme, the image, the red bird, the boy, the color gray, the space in between, the words, the letters, wandering, the wanderings. The illusion of a brick, this book, its title, its reflection in the mirror, the page, the act of turning back, the tie, the apple, the core, this poem is everything. The box, the poem, a lie written, a lie in response. If you fictitious are looking for, or if you fictitious are looking for, look in the folds where paper meets spying, where the edge is contained, where nowhere is a place to look, to go. Look just beyond the last line written. Look in between that space in between. And again, another piece about my cousin, North. Perhaps I identify with the character of Pagoda in Wes Anderson's The Royal Tenenbaums, the bad pink pants. He is Asian and I am Asian. He is a butler like I am a butler. And that scene played out as if in slow motion. He pulled out the small pocket knife, no bigger than the Swiss army knife my mother carries in her purse. She uses it for the sole purpose of peeling apples. She pulls out the knife, unfolds the blade. You son of a bitch. He stabs Royal. No more a stab than a symbolic prick. All is forgiven. He takes Royal to the hospital and they remain friends for the duration of their lives. Perhaps in real life, they are not really friends. They work in the same triangle sandwich factory. They shop in the same processed meat store. Royal translates Pagoda's language. Pagoda translates Royal, Royal's eating habits. Royal's eating ha habits affect Pagoda's life. Pagoda considers the idea of pricking Royal only because he has seen the movie. He thinks it is funny. He is not a violent man. He likes his job as the butler in the sandwich factory too much. He likes his pink pants. 
He is content with knowing that Royal is a prick. So I'm going to now read some works that are not yet published, and in a, in a sense, they are a return to the beginning. Um, I'm doing this series of works that are all based on erasures. All of, a lot of my students are working with um, this concept of erasing works. Um, Shakespeare, John Ashbery, and it kind of drives me crazy. <laughs> it drives me crazy. But, um, but I wanted to understand, get, get a deeper understanding of why it's, it's driving me crazy. So I decided to do some erasures myself, but I'm erasing myself. Um, I'm going back to my own works. I'm, re, uh, I'm currently working with placing the accents, and I am actually um, almost done with it. And I'm, re, I'm giving myself the task of only erasing. I can't rearrange the words. I can't add words. I'm just erasing. And so this is what's left. Uh, and I think what I'm, what's interesting is that I've, I've devoted a career to trying to, to in some ways master the form and, and, and gain control over the language, only to now work with this and arrive and having this realization that I'm arriving at a an imperfect and broken English. Um, so I, I think that's really. Uh, an interesting place to be at as a writer. Um, we'll see. I'll, we'll see if I can ever get back to actually generating words again. Um, right now, it's just the act of erasing. So this is from placing the accents. Bury the shoulder for travel. Need loaves. We're going. She insisted. On. She sold. She promised she would. Keep the gun. Don't. We're going. Stories were bricks. Bricks break a window. A house. Prayers printed. Paper stipend. By the time Father says to cut without clinging, accommodates. I watched the way my mother spoke. I watched fluttering parts of her prayer. I learned, I found, if only for a moment, I whispered in his ear, Awkward lips, lips I found in a box. I dreamt you were having Walt Whitman. I did for the first time in a language. That particular poem was really um, um, interesting to me because 20 years ago I, I wrote a poem in which I, I, I spoke about having tea with Walt Whitman. And I think what I really wanted to, to say was I dreamt of having sex with Walt Whitman. So it, it's, it's changed. 20 years later, I feel like I can own up to that. Well, direction. A self-taught I. I made a point. Learned the word <laughs> Learned it from a boy. Lit it with a match. The word <laughs> a word used with, at, of, of. Begin inside the sister at a corner. Memories, the brother waits in motion. The mother so the father began on this day for duration. Referring to you could not be done before breaking in threes my English, my tongue, stitch, 
thread men. I wait at night when haunting begins. She must be praying. The walls are thin. Peaches falling in the hidden space between. Pictures about boys doing things. Each word a grain of this ghost at the door quivering behind if anything I will words in a language she finds refuge in not knowing I'm not I swear I'm not eat as though there is slow salt of pepper patience a knife divides the heart when eating the other it's not about choosing the hand the outstretched fan before his face holding as if in your direction an empty chair on your behalf a subtle joust. You were, there was, beneath the gills. She insisted on the kind that bruised, thorned, tipped, lips collapsing. She crushes the seeds, rubs it to her nipples, says it was not meant to. She tells me as proof. The women wear teeth marks. Sit, salt, still, too much, and then what? Summer when, when she prepares, when placed at the porch, when beyond the door lives, all that is needed. Please do not enter. The aftertaste. I took for taking her wishes as if would break at the touch <laughs> was once it fell an apple from a mouth she heard a thud he woke in French she shouted he smiled thank you